Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome here tonight to the uh, special lecture organized by the Suterbeek uh, program. My name is Bart Jacobs, I'm a professor of computer security here at this university, and I have the humble task tonight of chairing this session. And this consists of first announcing the speaker uh, of this evening, Evgeny Morozov. He will speak for roughly 45 minutes, then we'll sit here together with him, uh, to, together with an extra guest, have a discussion in which you play an important role. So if you have questions, if questions come up, please wait with these questions until the end of the lecture by uh, Evgeny Morozov, because you will have ample opportunity at the end. <coughs> I would like to start with the question, who of you has read one of the books of Evgeny Morozov? Oh, that's... That's not bad, that's not bad. Who has, who has read one of his columns? Ah, there are quite a few. Uh, who has read uh, uh, one of his columns before this week, before the announcement? Ah, okay, 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 very good. Well, uh, Evgeny Morozov, I, I assume then that many of you know him. He publishes very uh, extensively written, uh, uh, read books, I think, uh, read by many of us. Uh, but also he's an active columnist for, I guess, almost any of the uh, important newspapers around the world, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, including in the Netherlands, the NRC. Uh, he has published two books, The Net Delusion 2011. Please come down and take a seat. Uh, and uh, to save everything, click here in 2013. And what really fascinates me is that afterwards, after publishing these thick books, he started doing a PhD in 2013 at Harvard University. I just wish all my PhD students would, <laughs> would operate in this way and uh, publish two, two uh, such serious books before they started uh, doing their PhD research. Uh, we are delighted to have him here tonight in uh, Nijmegen. And I will waste no more time and ask Evgeny to take the floor here and start this lecture. Evgeny Morozov, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming and thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm not going to ask you how many of you have read my tweets, which is at this point probably my pri primary uh, literary output. Uh, but uh, I think I'll start with an example that might uh, situate uh, what follows um, quite well. So uh, those of you who have been to the Philippines um, in the last few months and who have had uh, a chance to visit the public bathroom there might have noticed uh, something rather odd. Uh, the public bathrooms in uh, some of the cities in the Philippines um, right now feature a sensor uh, whereby the moment you leave the stall in the toilet, uh, an alarm goes off, and that alarm uh, continues ringing until you press the soap dispenser button. Thus, get some soap onto your hands, uh, wash your hands, and thus uh, leave the toilet. Um, the uh, operating principle of the system, uh, to you, of course, I think would be very familiar. It relies on a principle that many of you have come to see and notice in your everyday life, and it's the principle that by monitoring and observing and categorizing and cataloging your behavior, it becomes possible to also intervene in many of the things and activities that you do, right? Uh, most visibly, this principle is present in your smartphones, but also in many other tracking devices, whether those are wearables, whether those are you know, smart glasses for those of you who have it. Uh, the operating principle is the same. We can collect a lot of data about the behavior of individuals in real time. We can analyze it in real time. And in real time, we can have some kind of intervention. That intervention can be either in the form of the sound, which is very unlikely, as in the case of that uh, alarm in the, in the toilet in the Philippines, or it can be in the form of some kind of softer nudge that we would see popping up on our phone or on any of the other screens that we see. So the nudge would be purely visual. Uh, it's very easy to dismiss uh, this kind of innovation and this kind of thinking as just pure nonsense that comes from small startups, that's just uh, you know, fetishizing of technology, uh, and so forth. I would argue that it also represents, however, um, a very interesting but also a very disturbing trend where the primary onus and the primary way of regulating and solving problems uh, 
does rely on the power of information technology and does rely on the power of sensors and algorithms uh, to regulate the behavior of individuals. And uh, that's a sort of the overall trend I describe as solutionism in, in my book that came out uh, most recently. And that's a trend that I have been trying to understand uh, both politically, philosophically, and also sociologically. What does an ideology like solutionism presume about politics, about citizens, about political subjects, about the uh, kinds of political change that are possible today? but also what are the uh, roots of its popularity? Why is it that our governments and our institutions are so keen to take on these technological solutions as the default way of addressing some of the problems that we face? And I would argue that uh, this little example from the Philippines, where, by the way, the technology was not provided by some kind of small startup, but was actually delivered by a huge company, Procter & Gamble, um, that uh, is only a tiny bit in an overall rather huge map of similar changes happening elsewhere. I would argue that we are seeing the same changes in um, fields as diverse as health, uh, with all sorts of self-tracking uh, tools and devices and platforms that also seek to nudge you, the patient, to do certain things about your health. We see the same trends in energy, where again, your energy consumption habits are monitored, analyzed, and presented to you. We might also see them very soon in the realm of personal finance, where your spending habits will be analyzed, uh, trends identified, and at some point you will actually be informed that you ought not to be spending this extra two euros on a latte because that already goes over your budget. Right? You actually already see that uh, all of that becomes possible once every single uh, act of your everyday behavior is traced, tracked, analyzed, and stored somewhere. So as we move to a world that is fully mediated by digital technology, a world that is mediated by smartphones, a world that is mediated by technologies that have sensors and real-time connectivity, it becomes possible to draw much greater insight about the uh, activities of individuals. Right? And that in itself, uh, sociologically on the one hand, uh, gets uh, a lot of uh, interest and generates a lot of interest in uh, technology companies who just happen to be running the infrastructure for this problem solving, right? It's the Apples and the Googles of the world that run the hardware and the software through which this software sensor-based, monitoring-based kind of politics and kind of regulation can be enacted. So these companies are natural cheerleaders for many of these technologies. And it also generates a lot of excitement amongst politicians who like these technologies for a very different reason. Uh, namely that it's the kind of low-hanging fruit that allows them to create an illusion and some visibility and some kind of veneer that they actually can still regulate, they can still deliver the kind of um, acts that we expect of them as politicians, while at the same time controlling just the citizen and not other parts of the system. And this aspect is very important, and that would be, I argue, the, the sort of the key to understanding my message today, how we choose to tackle a problem whether we want to tackle it by focusing on the individual, right, whose behavior we can track and monitor very easily, or whether we choose to focus on corporations, lobbyists, other institutional and social forces that might be responsible for the problem we are trying to tackle, that decision in itself is a political decision. Right? So it's incorrect to assume that simply because citizens are much easier to track and monitor today, uh, than that we should pursue that option as our default regulatory response to the problems we are facing. Right? That in itself ought to be defended by the people pushing for these agendas. And what I mean by this is, is the following. If you think about self-tracking tools for health, for example, right? uh, which are often pitched to us as solutions to all sorts of problems like obesity, for example, right? the assumption that is made both by the technologists who are building the tool and by the regulators who are cheerleading for it, is that a problem like obesity is primarily the caused by certain irrational behavior on behalf of the patient and on behalf of the individual. So the assumption is that the reason why uh, you, know, you put on weight is because you cannot properly coordinate your diet or you cannot properly get enough exercise. And all of that now can be monitored through the mobile phone, through the smartphone, because we have sensors in it. And you yourself can be nudged, you can be asked, you can be uh, demanded to actually eat differently, exercise differently, walk differently. 
right? That assumption, however, goes against much of the uh, excellent scholarship and activist work that was done in the 1970s and 1980s that precisely tried to take disease as something that is purely biomedical and present it as something that is also sociopolitical, if you will, right? Where the argument is that the decisions that we make about food, about exercise, are not solely under our own control, right? Uh, what we eat is part of the result of uh, how much power we grant to the food companies, how much power we grant to the junk food companies when they decide how to regulate on television, how they decide how to cater in school cafeterias, right? So it's the result of the complex lobbying work that they do. It's the result of uh, uh, the various struggles over food labeling, right? It's not just the result of our own autonomous decision as individuals, right? We find ourselves amongst existing ongoing political struggles and that, uh, you know, it was the work of the social movements and critical health, for example, to try to understand what are those social factors that we can also regulate and tinker with in order to arrive at the solution of the problem. It's the same more or less with, if you stick to the problem of health, uh, it's the same with walking, right? If you live in America, right, in some obscure part of California, for example, it would be very hard for you to get enough exercise for the sole reason that there is nowhere to walk because the city or the village is optimized for the car and not for the passerby, right? So, of course, we can be trying to put and shift more and more responsibility on the shoulders of the citizen, telling them that, well, your smartphone suggests that you're not walking enough. Right? But of course, none of that can be fulfilled uh, without major effort on behalf of the individual, which would be easier in more urban settings with actual infrastructure for walking than outside. Right? The reason why I'm saying all this is that you can clearly see how decisions that are about how we ought to regulate and run our society and its various components, be that companies, be that infrastructure, be that physical space, be that food labeling, are suddenly no longer on the table. What's on the table is only what are the best ways through which we can monitor, control, and nudge the individual, right? And that shift from the more social and institutional kind of problem solving to this highly individualistic problem solving that assumes the citizen as its primary target is in itself, I would argue, a dangerous political transformation that we need to be cognizant of amidst all the celebration of innovation and disruption that inevitably uh, comes together with the introduction of all of these technologies. Right? That, of course, is not happening for the reason that our governments, I would argue, uh, have run out of uh, uh, basically time, money, and effort to tame those social and political forces. Right? Uh, our institutions, whether you're thinking about corporations or whether you're thinking about governments, whether you're thinking about think tanks, are becoming the very opposite of citizens. The citizens are becoming more and more transparent, more and more monitorable, more and more nudgeable, more and more governable, while the institutions are becoming the very opposite. They're becoming even more obscure, they're becoming even more uh, harder to monitor, they're becoming even less governable, and they are actually deliberately taking steps to uh, obfuscate many of the activities. Governments are classifying more and more documents. Uh, you have governments outsourcing more and more of their activities to the private sector, where basically you cannot actually uh, ask for any information because private uh, companies are not subject in many countries to freedom of information laws. Uh, you're also getting uh, big energy companies producing all sorts of research that actually seeks to change established scientific opinion on climate change and thus mislead the public, all of these actors actually deliberately trying to be less transparent, right? And as a result, our politics shifts towards the low-hanging fruit of the system, and the low-hanging fruit of the system is the citizen, right? Um, and this is what I think I find particularly troubling about the infrastructure for problem solving that, that we are putting in place, because it ultimately destroys our ability to think in causal terms, right? And it's this uh, focus on causality that I think has traditionally characterized how we thought about politics. Politics in the past used to be about trying to do something about the causes of the problems, right? We try to understand why does a problem like crime exist? Why does a problem like terrorism exist? Why does a problem like climate change exist? Why does a problem like obesity exist? I can continue like that for a very long time, right? Those were the kind of questions we were asking. And we tried to do something about the root causes 
at the heart of the problem, right? Right now, we are finding ourselves in um, a very weird form of utopia where we are generating so much data about one particular player in the narrative plot, and that player is the citizen, that we're actually abandoning the questions of causality and just focusing on what we can do about the effects that these problems are causing, right? So, of course, and that's what we're actually measuring when we're measuring the behavior of the citizens. We can measure how much energy we are consuming, we can measure how much exercise we do, we can measure how much food we are eating, we can measure how likely we are to commit crime and how likely we are to commit error, uh, to commit terror, right? But ultimately, all of those behaviors are not just the result or the product of our own individual decision making or our own autonomous uh, process of growing up, right? All of them are in one way or another shaped by various socio-political and economic factors that lie far outside of our control, right? And it used to be that the subject of politics in itself was all about trying to go and do something about those causal forces. My fear is that uh, that old school politics is no longer on the table, right? And we can talk about the historical and sociological reasons as to why that has happened. You know, I sort of uh, hinted at some of the factors. I do think that it has to do with the way in which uh, governments have just relied far too much on the private sector uh, and they have kind of abandoned, uh, or they have been captured by the private sector, which is probably an even better way to explain the situation, but that's the reality. So what happens is that, of course, since we are only controlling the effects of the problems and not the causes, the only way to do it at large scale is to monitor everything that happens. That's the only way to identify, preempt, and do something about the effects of the problems. That's why we do have large-scale um, surveillance of virtually everything, not just things related to terror, but eventually everything connected to health, energy, you name it. Because the idea, again, is not to try to resolve the problem by tracing back how that problem has developed, but try to prevent it and intervene in real time to prevent it from becoming an, an, an even bigger problem. Right? And you can see that logic at work in, in many domains, again, where the idea is not to try to come up with a historical narrative and still think in uh, a kind of mode that assumes that there is a historical past and there is a future and we're not just living in the present moment. But no, the idea now is to assume that we are living in the real time that is just now, and what we want to do is to regulate what's happening in this particular moment by controlling the behavior of the participants in the system, right? And uh, if that's the kind of politics that we are moving towards, and I would argue that, again, with the proliferation of sensors in uh, the smart home, in the smart car, in how we consume energy, in smart glasses, in virtually everything that we carry and everything that we do, such real-time interventions will become uh, very cheap, very easy, and very tempting not to do. I mean, at this point, uh, you can clearly see how the infrastructure that has been built by Silicon Valley, both in terms of software and hardware, is extremely conducive to that agenda. So, I mean, right now, if you want to go and understand, uh, you know, where is it that Ebola is developing, you would probably be better off looking at how people search for symptoms on Google, right? It would just logically, it makes sense to go and see who is it in the world that is typing, I have a flu, I have a headache, and then try to come up with some kind of a action plan based on that. You don't need to actually develop a more sophisticated model. It's enough to look at the data points and do something about them, right? And the, 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 the rationale here, again, I think is, is very interesting. That system is already there. That data is being generated, right? That data is, genu is being generated regardless of whether we look at it or not. Right? And then it becomes uh, a problem for privacy activists or for people who are concerned about the, the, the evaporation of politics from the public realm to argue as to why this data should not be used. Right? And Ebola might be an extreme case, but you can easily think how the same kind of rationale will apply to any other domain. I mean, with energy, you can also see how, how easy it can, it can function. If you are any device will tell you that, well, perhaps you should unplug it or you should be spending, or you should be using it differently or that you know, you're spending more energy than the house next door. Again, it's, it's a nice adjustment of how you function within the system. It does not do anything on a broader scale about how the energy and the electricity system has come into being, how companies are regulated and so forth. So in a sense, 
It's a way to, keep, to buy time, and it's a way to keep the system working by tinkering with the attitudes and the behaviors of its users without doing anything about the, the, the actual composition of forces that have created the system uh, in the first place. And for me, uh, it is a very remarkable and powerful, but also a very dangerous undertaking because, again, the disappearance of causality from uh, even how we think about um, life, and political life especially, um, is very symptomatic of the overall disappearance of feelings like solidarity and feelings like mutual association or, or, or sociality as such. Right? Uh, it's very hard for us to understand uh, shared grievances, to understand what it is that we owe to each other, to understand how we can engage in collective efforts to change the world if we cannot even articulate why certain problems exist the way they exist and we just focus on the effects. Right? All sorts of political struggles eventually derive from our ability to tell a story how a given problem has developed. And for me, I think a, a tool and a, and, and a, and a paradigm for how uh, Silicon Valley and technology companies in general can present um, a solution to the problems that we face without addressing any of the root causes behind them would be uh, Google Now, which those of you who use Android phones uh, might have seen uh, or even used. Uh, and it's a system, I often use it in my examples, but I think Google Now really is the paradigm of where search is going, but it's also a paradigm of where this real-time, uh, data-intensive uh, kind of algorithmic regulation uh, idea is actually heading as well. So those of you who don't know, Google Now works as follows. It basically tracks everything you do on different Google services. So it tracks what you do in your email. It tracks all of the plane reservations or hotel reservations you have in your email. It uh, tracks what you search for. It tracks your location. It tracks the websites you have visited. It basically tracks the videos you've seen on YouTube. Everything that Google already tracks about you is also available to Google Now. And by analyzing what's happening in your life, Google now, and that's the, almost a direct quote from its developers, it's seeking to give time back to the users. Right? So the idea is that by analyzing at great scale everything that you do, uh, it will be possible to make certain decisions for you to simplify your life in a certain way by identifying some of the unpleasant hassle and taking it out of your life, and thus giving the time that you would otherwise not have to you so that you can enjoy the things you're actually doing, right? or you might be doing. So the way it works is that if Google identifies that you have a plane reservation in your email, it will automatically remind you of the flight. It will tell you how much time it will take to get to the airport based on the real-time traffic conditions. It will automatically check you into your flight. It will tell you the weather uh, at the destination where you're going. It will tell you if you are standing right now, right here, that there is a cinema center, for example, next door, and those films are being shown. It will analyze your email for any mentions of meetings you might be having and remind you of those meetings. It basically does what a secretary would do, right? But it does it not like Siri does for Apple. It does it by analyzing everything about you and then making decisions and making predictions based on that, right? And I think that Google Now is a very interesting product in that you can clearly see that it does not actually demand of you to know anything about the past or about anything, really. Because the system will contextually provide everything that you need to know at any given time, including probably search. So if you closely follow the rhetorical statements made by some of Google's executives, you can see that they're becoming really excited about what they call autonomous search. And it's the idea that you know, your smartphone, and Google Now more specifically, will be actually conducting all of the searches that you might be conducting yourself in the background, serving you the relevant information you might need at a particular point in time, so the search itself becomes unnecessary. Right? That's the ultimate step in saving time. Right? Instead of having you go to the Google search window and type in, show me flights from Amsterdam to Paris, the system will do it on its own and show you those flights because it understands your informational needs, uh, analyzing everything else you've done in the past. That's the idea, right? And this is how it's saving time. Uh, and, you know, I've been testing it for quite a long time now, and at this point I can assure you that for 
uh, many tasks, it actually works. But the basic idea that you can actually relieve the pressure from users from knowing that they are standing next to a museum or from knowing that they are standing next to a cinema house or by knowing anything actually about what has been happening in their life, so what's happening in their life now, it also undermines the ability to come up with any kind of narrative that will explain what it is that they do and how it is that they relate to the world or the culture at large. Because essentially, the only things that you need to know uh, in that system is how to turn it on. That's it, right? The rest is generated automatically based on context. It's generated based on your location, it's generated based on your plans, it's generated based on everything that the system has learned about you so far. And to me, that's actually indicative of the kind of shift towards the real-time politics that, again, has abandoned narrativity, has abandoned causality, and that just exists by uh, perpetually drawing on some kind of feedback loops to make us effectively and efficiently achieve the tasks that we have set for ourselves. In that sense, this system is perfect in that it allows us to take on and tackle an increasingly growing number of tasks that we face. And we are all facing more and more tasks because our lives are becoming more and more complicated, more and more complex. We do not have jobs that last from nine to five anymore. We have to struggle with smaller jobs. It increases the kind of hassle we have in our lives. And Google now, from that perspective, does allow us to deal with a situation that would otherwise be unmanageable, right? It would require either us uh, feeling burnt out and stressed, or it would require just some of us withdrawing from the participation in, 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 in the market altogether. Uh, so in that, sense, in that way, Google Now is not just uh, indicative of this shift away from temporality and the shift away from causality and narrativity. It's also a very nice illustration of how technology at this point has become something like a magic wand, something like a dose ex machina, which you can bring on stage as a politician or as a society to help you deal with the crisis that might otherwise become unmanageable. Right? And I would argue that many of these technological solutions that you see, uh, whether it has to do with self-tracking uh, in health or with tracking in energy or with this kind of silly nudging tools that I've described that you see in, in bathrooms and elsewhere, they have to do precisely with the fact that the system and the, the state uh, has a very difficult time relying on other forms of regulatory action. And that is either for political or economic reasons or solely for the ideological ones. Right? Since uh, we are living at a time where you know, we do operate in a paradigm that I can only describe as neoliberal, where we do not actually believe in ideas like social justice or laws anymore. We cannot actually use those to regulate some of the behavior that would otherwise be regulated by appealing to some kind of decency or by appealing to laws. I mean, all of that is slowly being taken off the table. So the only way in which the system can continue functioning is that if you supplement those with a different paradigm, and that paradigm in our case is the paradigm of technology, where you rely on sensors, uh, internet connectivity, all sorts of schemes like gamification, to get citizens to do things that they would have previously done for very different reasons, right? And the fascination that Silicon Valley shows with gamification, for me, is very telling. I mean, those of you who don't know what gamification is, it's basically using the uh, various games and points, currency and rewards, and virtual currencies especially, it can also be reputation on Facebook, to compensate people for activities they might not otherwise do on their own will. Right? And it has become a big business, and there are a lot of consultants and think tanks going around and preaching gamification as a way to resolve some of the problems that we face. To give you a very simple example, uh, think about you walking down the street somewhere you know, in, in the middle of a Dutch town, and you see litter lying on the ground. Right? And uh, in the past, when we still operated under a somewhat different uh, mental and moral and political paradigm, well, perhaps you would pick up that litter because you thought that that's what good citizenship is all about. You would think that, well, you're living in a city together with other people, and that's what kind of good, normal attitude towards living in the city with others is all about. Or you can think of a somewhat different paradigm where you would rely on laws that would ask everybody who sees litter on the pavement to pick it up. And, you know, of course, it didn't probably happen anywhere, maybe with an exception of countries like Singapore, 
But that's an alternative paradigm, right? We can rely on laws, fines, and kind of threat of legal action to get things done. So you can have morality, you can have law. But what's happening right now is that you have this very bizarre integration of technology on the one hand and then the market form on the other, where your phone would know when you're actually uh, you know, going down to pick up litter. It will know that it's litter, and it can easily reward you with three points that at the end of the month you can convert into a free latte and thus be a good citizen and also win something at the end. Right? That's the paradigm in which we operate right now. And that's the paradigm that is very easy to implement given that sites like Facebook have created a way for us to tap into entirely new forms of motivation because it has been understood that we would do things either to win some kind of emotional, social capital and thus impress our friends, or we would do it because we would actually be rewarded with points that can later be converted into some kind of an actual award. Um, now there are very good reasons why such uh, motives and why such programs are taking off right now. They're taking off because I don't think that the other two paradigms are actually defensible. Uh, defensible precisely because of the specificity of the historical time in which we are living. It's undefensible to demand more laws, and it's even more indefensible to expect that people will still operate on a paradigm of sociality where we're continuously being pushed to think in very individualistic terms, rely on the market, and act in our own benefit. Right? Uh, so with that in mind, it, 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 you can clearly see that technology at this point does play this uh, role of a savior. Right? It's something that allows the political system that we have to preserve the veneer of normalcy and to pretend that everything is okay without ever actually bringing up some of the uh, moral and political implications that are involved in a shift from moral and legal code to the actual technical market code. Because again, I don't think gamification is just about technology, it's actually about the introduction of market logic very often into, the, in, into our motivation. If you listen to guys from Silicon Valley, they'll tell you that there is no difference. They are essentially the same modes of regulating behavior. That it doesn't matter whether you rely on gamification or whether you rely on laws or whether you rely on norms, because ultimately all that matters is cost and efficiency. If those solutions will be cheaper and if they get more citizens to perform uh, what is expected of them, that's all that matters. That, of course, is not the case precisely because I would argue by changing the type of motivation that you are using, you're also producing different subjects. Right? To me, it's obvious that the person who obviously and regularly thinks of his civic duties and of some kind of citizenship and thinks about what it's like to live with others, if, this, if those behaviors are more or less you know, regular and in, in some sense you know, they are not singular, then you would come up with a very different attitude towards the market, the state, sociality, your fellow beings, and so forth. If you're continuously being appealed to through market logic, rewards, points, you name it, it's not obvious to me that you will still continue performing that behavior once you withdraw the rewards. Right? And that's the uh, more disturbing part. Because once you kind of generate political subjects, i.e. citizens, who only think in that paradigm of rewards, points, recognition, currencies being given and paid for their behavior, then of course, then you have to introduce those incentives into all domains of everyday life where previously you relied on the somewhat different motivation. You can actually have empirical studies that prove that, that show that changing from one um, type of motivation to another will have that kind of effect. Right? Uh, and uh, I think we just have to understand that it's, again, gamification, sensors, algorithms, those are just one of the many ways in which technology essentially prolongs the viability of our current political system while radically transforming its content, moving it away from a far more, I would argue, democratic and political, and by political I mean that we're actually asking questions, who causes what problems and how do we solve them? That's what I mean by political. So we're moving away from that mode to a mode that looks uh, much uglier. And I think the last frontier of this uh, in uh, our everyday life would be the question of what is going to happen to our personal data. And here I don't mean just the usual perspective on those things we hear from privacy activists, Edward Snowden, and, and that crowd that does extremely important work, which I do not mean to disparage in any way. Uh, there is, however, another dimension to uh, this increased datification of our lives. And that dimension has to do with the fact that 
both governments and companies and increasingly citizens have realized that that data has monetary value or at least that it can be put on the market and there is money to be made from it, right? And what I mean by this is that uh, it has become obvious that the reason why Google can produce a service like Google now is because ultimately it draws on all of the data that we have left at its servers. You take away my search data, my email data, my geo data from Google, and Google will not be able to do the kind of predictions that it does with Google now. Right? You take a lot of other kinds of data from Google, and it will not be able to do the kind of personalization of search results that it does. It will not be able to sell advertising the way it does. The entire business models right now operate on essentially claiming that we should leave our data with these giant companies because these giant companies are going to produce extra benefits to us, the users. Right? That's one perspective. Another perspective comes from a different wing of Silicon Valley, and those are smaller startups that essentially argue that if only we would let them uh, store our data, uh, they would find even better advertisers, and they would actually share the proceeds with us. So we ourselves can become data entrepreneurs. We can actually make money, we can put our data up in the cloud, and then we would be paid on everything that we do, because everything that we do will be monitored, stored, and uploaded to the cloud based on whoever accesses that data, they'll essentially have to pay a fee, that fee will be shared with us. Right? That's the second kind of solution to the data question. And then you have governments who, uh, by the way, have also recognized that all this data has a value, and the governments themselves are sitting on lots of it, and perhaps, uh, given that they are facing a tremendous economic and fiscal crisis, and given that they have already privatized almost everything they could have privatized, data is the next obvious frontier. So what they're doing is trying to, for example, if you look at Britain, they're trying to sell off uh, patient data uh, from the National Health Service. They're trying to sell off uh, student data that was gathered while students were applying to universities. And what I mean by sell is that they share it with advertisers. They share it with mobile networks. They share it with um, the companies manufacturing soft juices and soft drinks and so forth. Right? Again, it's an effort to generate some money right, based on the data that the state has accumulated. So we find ourselves in this very bizarre situation where our choice is between um, one type of extreme neoliberalism where you have two or three giant corporations that are monopolists that are telling us that we should keep our data with them because if we take our data from them, they are going to deliver an inferior service. You have a bunch of entrepreneurs who are telling us that we should record everything about our own life and trade this, trade this data because it's a way to make money and who doesn't want to make money now given that real incomes are stagnating and people actually would want to have some money given that we are living under a financial crisis, right? It's a very appealing proposition. And then you have governments who for themselves are trying to do something with that data, again, understanding that they need this cash to fill the gaps in their budgets, right? And uh, you can clearly see how all three of these actors are basically trying to use data as a way to deal with a crisis of sorts. Right? And they're all kind of uh, convincing us that uh, uh, data is an asset, right? data is a commodity, it has already been privatized, it already should be treated that way, there is no way back, there is no way out. Right? That, however, I think is a premature decision, it's a premature answer. There is no reason why we should treat data as an asset, to treat it as a commodity, to treat it as something that ought to be traded in the secondary or even primary market. Right? We have had those debates about other commodities and other assets. We have had that debate about whether water should be treated as a commodity and provided by for-profit companies or whether it ought not to be privatized and it ought to be provided by some kind of a public utility. We have had the same debate about uh, electricity. We can have the same debate about air. There are basic debates we have about infrastructure. Right? And of course, given the historical and economic conditions we are living through, we are losing those fights also. So we are seeing a general retreatment, a general retreat of the public in one way or another from questions of who owns water, who owns, private, who owns air, who owns electricity. All of those are being privatized as well. But there is no reason why we should just completely from the very beginning buy into the answers that has already been uh, forced on us, the public, 
and accept data as something that is a commodity and something that is an asset. That's the rhetoric we hear from the World Economic Forum in Davos. That's the rhetoric we hear from Silicon Valley. That's the rhetoric we hear from Wall Street. And that's the rhetoric we hear from the European Commission. Once you put those four powerful players together, believe me, chances are that they are not acting in the best interest of the public. Uh, and that, for me, would be uh, a good first sign to start questioning and thinking about uh, what alternative ways in which we can prevent that data from becoming the, the commodity that will rule our lives. Because I, I hope you understand that even if you pursue the second option, whereby you yourself are in charge of your own data and you can sell it, uh, it basically means that there will be no end as to how much uh, financialization, to use a fancy term, you're going to experience in your life. Because your data, every single act that you do, you open the fridge in the morning, you sing a song in the shower, all of that will be valuable. There will be a company that manufactures shampoos somewhere that would want to know what song you're singing in the shower. Right? The reason why that transaction hasn't happened yet was because there was no sensor in your shower and there was no internet connectivity and there was no way to sell that fact in real time. Now the possibility is there, and once you start treating that as the kind of a commodity that can be traded, you can clearly see that even the value of your overall data portfolio, which you might otherwise describe as your life, is always fluctuating. It's not the same all the time. It fluctuates based on where you are, whom you meet, what you do. Right? So if we actually buy into that paradigm, we will always be like uh, you know, hustlers on Wall Street trying to sell date, data about us at the, most, uh, at the highest price to the highest bidder at a particular moment in time. It basically only solidifies our connection to the financial markets, right? which for, I think, a lot of people would not necessarily be uh, such, a good, uh, such a good idea. So with all of that said, I think clearly the, the political issue here is to what extent we can articulate uh, a, an alternative paradigm for thinking about data. And it's the same alternative paradigm that we also need to articulate for thinking about infrastructure at large, not just the data, but all of the sensors and the filters through which that data is being gathered, through which that data is being filtered as well. You all have seen what has happened uh, last summer where Facebook, or at least researchers using Facebook, were caught uh, manipulating the moods of the users, right? Whereby uh, some users saw stories that were more positive, some users saw stories that were more negative, uh, and eventually it was found out that the users who saw more positive stories ended up producing more user engagement on the site, and thus were actually more, uh, uh, they were more uh, kind of favored by Facebook because clearly they were better for advertisers because they generated more clicks and thus revealed more about what it is that they do and what it is that they are. You can clearly see how the ownership of the filtering mechanism at this point, not the ownership of data and not the ownership of sensors, in itself uh, tweaks the system and directs it towards a certain agenda. Right? The reason why our social media today works the way it does it's because it's designed to fulfill a particular business model, right? So Facebook will always be interested in manipulating what it is that you see in your feed because it's only by manipulating what you see in your feed that they will be able to increase the number of clicks that you generate. So the reason why Facebook and Twitter feel so distracting and they feel as if they're always pressuring you to click more, to update, to check what else is happening, in part because they are built to do precisely that. They're built to make you distracted. They're built to make you click as fast as possible because the more you click, the more the site knows about you, the more valuable you are to the advertiser. Right? There is nothing inherent about social media or Twitter or Facebook or microblogging or social networking that is distracting. That distraction comes as a result of their business model, right? which also means that there is a way to do the filtering and to do the design of these platforms differently. Right? Once you figure out a way how they can be tied to a different funding model, right? how they can be kind of decoupled from the advertising world and coupled with some other world. Right? And the, the fact, of course, is that if you look at the political and economic situation today, we have lost the ability to take activities and enterprises and services that have been one way or another corroded by the market mechanism and put them elsewhere. That's not the direction in which the process usually works. 
usually the process goes and travels in the other direction, where it takes things that have previously functioned on a logic that had nothing to do with the market, and we place it back under the sort of the, the, the market mechanism. Right? And this, uh, I think, actually signifies one of the bigger threats to uh, the, 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 the project of modern democracy, if you will. We have traditionally assumed that modernity, in, in one way or another, and particularly you know, the, the kind of modernity we might describe as a social democracy, where you kind of have capitalism, but you also have democracy, and democracy takes care of some of the worst excesses of capitalism, we have always assumed that that system was marked by some kind of social differentiation, where you would have this uh, sort of areas uh, of activity which would be driven by a logic that had uh, you know, its own uh, set of goals and values, and it was not just, it did not always default to the money and the currency and the market as its default good. Right? You look at education, you look at sport, you look at art, I mean, the assumption was, you look at bureaucracy, the assumption always was that those are semi-autonomous domains which operate according to their own system of value, that what is good in education is not the same as what is good in, in art, and what is good in finance is not the same as what's good in, you know, in philosophy. Right? So the idea was that you, know, you might be extremely rich, but even if you are extremely rich, that will not entitle you to you know, jump ahead of the queue in uh, a queue to you know, some kind of a theater. Right? The idea always was that, you know, of course there were exceptions, but the idea always was that we are trying to build this autonomous separate domains that will operate on a logic that was not just the logic of the market. And that's why you have a lot of conservative thinkers, you know, Nicholas Luhmann comes to mind in Germany, kind of celebrating this uh, differentiation what I think, however, is happening is that as we're introducing sensors and internet connectivity into everything, it becomes much easier to basically introduce the logic of the market into that domain as well. And it might just be that the logic of the market is already uh, imminent in that domain, and the sensor is just uh, a natural manifestation of it. But to me, it also seems obvious that the introduction of connectivity and the sensor speeds up and amplifies com commodification. What I mean by this is that this summer, those of you who were reading the newspapers may have seen a story about a very particular type of app called Monkey Parking that appeared in San Francisco, and there is a similar app that appeared also in Boston. And uh, you might say that it's just a bizarre American thing, but I think it kind of captures the logic according to which many other industries and many other domains are changing. And what that app, Monkey Parking, did was that it basically allowed the driver who was leaving a parking spot that was public parking, that was essentially for free, to sell that spot to whoever needed it the most through an auction system. So essentially, you have an app, I have an app, I live a public parking spot, there is no other parking spot, I can sell my spot to you, even though the spot itself is public and there is no need to pay for it. Right? And they would, of course, their defense was that all they were selling was information. All they were selling was the information that I was leaving the pu public parking spot and somebody else was buying that information. So it, it was not that I was selling something I didn't know. Right? But to me, that ex this example illustrates quite nicely the way in which it becomes possible to introduce market relations into domains that were previously not subject to them and thus reverse the kind of differentiation I was talking about. Right? So you're essentially getting the differentiation whereby the domains that previously operated on a different set of goals, in this example you know, with public parking, the idea has always been fairness. The goal was that you know, we don't care how rich you are, everybody is treated the same when it comes to parking your car in the city. Like that is gone. Right? You see the similar apps now being built for restaurants where you can actually get a booking at a restaurant depending on you know, how much you're willing to pay for being put ahead of others at the sort of for, for fancy restaurants for, for, the, uh, for, the, for the queue. But there you also see the same, the same thing in action. And I would argue that if you think about what has been happening in other domains, you can think you know, of bookstores and Amazon, you can think of many other examples. The, uh, the idea is essentially the same. I mean, much of this social differentiation that I'm talking about as the kind of the, the highlight of the uh, uh, modernity and of the social democratic state 
it rested on the assumption that there are certain imperfections in our system. That, you know, the, the, I can come to a bookstore and uh, I will buy the book simply because there is no way for me to look up that that book costs 20% less on Amazon. Right? That's, the, that's what sort of the, 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 the reason why the system functioned was in part because there was scarcity of information and there was no way to immediately uh, profit from some kind of arbitrage and, and knowledge arbitrage. Um, that default condition of ignorance that has been programmed into our system is no longer there, in part because through the introduction of sensors and connectivity, you can build feedback loops that will work in real time. And you know, something like Uber already indicates how that system can function. Right? You can essentially sample both the supply and demand in real time. You can bring them together. You don't have to like, program anything. You don't have to program you know, a dispatcher. All of that can be done on the fly through some kind of algorithmic uh, matching. And if that is really the case, then I think you know, the, the only way for us to reverse that system would be, if you want to stick to just the domain of technology, it would be to, of course, start asking questions about who runs uh, the algorithms and the sensors, who runs the filters, and who owns the data. I mean, for me, those are the questions that have been answered for us, because we have assumed that Silicon Valley excels at innovation. We have assumed that uh, data is a commodity. We have assumed that uh, it's OK for uh, Facebook and Twitter to filter our messages based on their own business model and on based on some kind of idea of public interest. All of that has happened. Uh, but it's also true to me, and it seems to me the case, that even those struggles about narrow technological questions ought to be situated in a much broader economic and political terrain. We have to understand that even if we embrace the agenda I have just outlined, let's do something about infrastructure, filters, sensors, data, and so forth, uh, the reality of the contemporary situation, especially in Europe, is that there is simply very little money to spend on infrastructure. There is no money and no desire and no willingness to contest the power of lobbyists in Silicon Valley that they sent to Brussels. There is very little desire to actually build uh, fully uh, private, decentralized uh, systems that will not be susceptible to all of those nudging efforts at nudging that you know, even our policymakers want to do. Uh, and if that's the case, then the struggle ought to leave the domain of the technological and move into the purely political domain, where we need to start linking uh, our fiscal policy to our technology policy, because essentially that's what it is. If we don't have money to invest into infrastructure, we are not going to have a different technological environment. That's just not going to happen. We can continue building fancy algorithms, fancy programs, fancy software, fancy gadgets that will be secure, private, and so forth. The reality is that it's a political decision that keeps the current infrastructure in place. And unless we challenge that, you know, and challenging that would require working in national capitals, would require working in Brussels, would require working perhaps even with the European Central Bank and perhaps undermining it. That's what needs to be done. We cannot just contain that struggle solely on the terrain of the technology. Because ultimately, the reason why Silicon Valley has emerged as the default provider of all of the solutions to our problems, it's not just because they are great salesmen or because we are so fascinated uh, by technology that we cannot know better. It's also in part because all the other alternative modes of taking action and problem solving have either been tamed by big business or they have been discredited by the ideology of neoliberalism, or they have just uh, somehow outlived their own usefulness because our own governments and our own traditional vehicles of representation, like trade unions, for example, haven't caught up with the times. And if that's the case, then the challenge ahead for us is much bigger and much greater than trying to articulate a different technological paradigm. We can articulate it easily. We can articulate it really well. The problem is that its implementation will require the kind of political struggle that few of us can actually realize today. And essentially, people working on these issues in technology, hackers, activists, privacy advocates, all of the people that have supported Snowden and some of those who have supported Wikileaks before, would eventually need to find a way to build bridges to other social movements that are working on issues that seemingly might look disconnected 
from the technology agenda. And here I'm talking about movements opposing the austerity measures. I'm talking about movements opposing uh, some of the uh, monetary policy done by the European Central Bank within Europe, if you want to focus. You know, you will, be, you will need to be much more critical about various transatlantic trade treaties signed between uh, Brussels and Washington. All of that will need to happen. All of, the, all of that right now does not fit the traditional remain, the traditional domain of technopolitics, but it will need to be, because ultimately all of those questions are interrelated, and unless we try to see that technology at this point is solely an extension of the weaknesses of our political regime, we are not going to make any corrections in, 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 in our situation. Um, I think I'll stop here, and maybe we'll open up for questions and debate, of course. Please, please have a seat. I would like to uh, invite uh, Michiel van Otterlo to join us too here. Michiel, you're an a uh, Martijn, sorry, Martijn, Martijn van Otterlo. Uh, you're a researcher in AI. And uh, I guess you've heard some interesting things. I've heard a lot of interesting things. Is my mic on? Yes. Yeah. And have, what new things have you heard? Well, I've read the books and I've talked to Vivkeni a lot of uh, today. So in that sense, nothing new. But I guess that's... Um, what striking things have you heard? What it, well, it's more what I'm missing. Um, ah. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's on, on this very nice evening with one day of very uh, sunny weather. We, uh, I mean, it's kind of like a, um, uh, a very negative conclusion in the end. I mean, uh, either uh, we just go for uh, what happens uh, all this uh, with all this technology development, or we should uh, really change society, because you're not talking about just changing something in technology, but also like mm -hmm. changing the political system. And um, a lot of people are working on the problems you identify, like you have solutionism and internet centrism, and mm -hmm. that creates all these problems. But for people, this really creates problems that they want to see solved by people who work on privacy, for example. That's what I call solutionism. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but there are still people who think that they can solve like uh, part of the problem, depending on how you frame it. What, what is your point? So what is well, missing? My, my point is um, you can frame it either as a privacy problem, as a surveillance problem, mm -hmm. as a power imbalance balance in society. And there are many solutions like explaining to the people. Maybe mm -hmm. in eventually we, you will get a political um, change. Uh, regulating law transparency, m showing what uh, companies do, uh, making everybody um, learn how to program. Maybe that will uh, uh, so make you're them asking understand. for better labeling, clearer labeling and clearer associated well, solution? Well, the, the, the end question is, what is the, the, the best frame for the problem? And what are all these solutions worth? Are there any good solutions for maybe part of the problems? Mm -hmm. So the, to answer your question, I, I would say that um, you're entirely correct that much here depends on how you want to define the problem. And if you define the problem too narrowly, that you might get the illusion of having solved it uh, while in fact you might have only made it worse. And here I'm thinking about privacy specifically where if you look at a lot of folks in, in, in Silicon Valley in America and even some people in Europe, uh, they are very happy to build apps that will, for example, give you some kind of privacy and security for a very small fee. You pay five euros a month and you know, you have a great app on your phone that will make sure that your communications are encrypted. To a lot of people who approach this question solely from the perspective of can we actually build apps that provide security, the fact that you have to pay five euros for it is not a question. For me, it's clearly a question because it takes something that used to be provided to us uh, more or less for free and creates a commodity out of it. So now I have to pay for privacy just like I have to pay for, you know, booking seats on an airline the way I didn't have to pay 10 years ago. So there I can clearly see a very kind of disturbing trend where things that have previously been uh, 
provided in either free or somewhat free manner are becoming commodities and privacy would be one of them. And I'm not saying that that's the default solution to privacy. I'm just saying that for me, continue to, to continue talking about the solution solely on technical terms of whether they deliver or not would be to miss the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is, you know, the economic and political relations within the markets and the state. They're all of these solutions in one way or another, like a complicit end. So... But there are, there's no happy message of like partial solutions that individuals can uh -huh. get a, I mean, are not manipulated so much or they still have the sense of some privacy or mm -hmm. they can feel that they can do something or is that all in vain? Well, again, m much depends on how you want to uh, sort of uh, slice the contemporary situation. For me, uh, it's perfectly possible to arrive at a world where you will find individualistic solutions to such problems. And, you know, particularly, as I've said, if you have some money to spend, none of the problems I kind of alluded to, I didn't even get into some of the problems related to discrimination. If we move to a sure. society of full self-tracking where, you know, your insurance company might know what you do <clears throat> and thus modify its, you know, its, uh, it, its package. I mean, yes, if you're very rich, None of those are big issues. You can afford to pay for privacy. You can afford to, to pay for discrimination. You can afford to have a private doctor, like, and so forth. But again, there you can clearly see how it very easily becomes a class issue. But even beyond that, my point is not that we can come up with some solutions that will alleviate the problems of individuals. The fact that we're even thinking in those terms already presupposes that the kind of social, collective, um, you know, community-based solution is no longer even on the table. So we are looking for ways in which individuals can become very happier. It's very easy to make individuals happy. Just tinker with their Facebook feed. That's like what we've discovered this summer. Like, is it the kind of political solution you want? I don't know, I don't. Okay. Very good. Can, I, can I try to give the audience uh, an opportunity? Who in the audience wants to uh, react, ask a question preferably, who dares? There should be microphones available. Over there, that gentleman over there was the first one, I think. Uh, but I've, I've noted two, two people here in the beginning. It's over there. It's over there. Yeah, further down, there. further down. Yeah. <coughs> please, please state your name and, and your background. Yeah. And complain. Okay, uh, my name is uh, Fritz Vaandrager. I'm a professor in computer science here in uh, Nijmegen. So you make a very interesting point. You say, well, for the government, it's sort of interesting to sort of use technology to solve certain problems which maybe otherwise uh, they, they, they are not able to solve. Yeah. And, and now, in Holland, um, we have a woman who chairs the Dutch parliament who didn't even know what ICT means. <laughs> the uh -huh. Dutch government is sort of wasting between one and five billion dollars per year sure. on ICT projects that fail. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say the Dutch government is not able to play this role and, and actually doesn't do it. It's just the sure. Dutch citizens who themselves like the technology. So, sure. so your po point governments are too stupid to do this, mm -hmm. uh, 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 what, you, what you think they're doing? Again, I think that here you have to, you have to broaden uh, how you think about technology. Uh, the really hard stuff is happening in how our very bureaucratic uh, policies like insurance, healthcare, and everything else are being redefined in order to shift more and more responsibility for your own well-being towards the individual. I mean, that's happening across Europe. You know, we simply because the welfare state cannot afford to pay for universal kind of unpersonalized care that everybody gets on the same conditions our own laws are being rewritten in a way as to put more onus on you, the individual, to take care more of yourself. And you know that is happening. The government doesn't need to know anything about IST to push for those changes, which they are pushing for anyway. <coughs> right? And this is where you get this very bizarre intersection between the private sector producing all of those monitors, self-tracking devices, and you know, all of that is happening, including by a lot of Dutch companies, by the way. Uh, right? And then they integrate themselves with insurance providers and laws and the changes in, 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 in various parts of the welfare state to produce outcomes that can only be described as some kind of nudging where, where you, know, you are expected to get compensation for the fact that you, know, you walk more, sleep less, or, or sleep more, sleep better. I mean, this is what's happening. I mean, I don't think that if you think about the future of the welfare state in 15 to 20 years, you will actually be able 
to live your life and still get the benefits from the state without perpetual monitoring of every single act for which you expect to receive benefits. In Britain, I'll give you an example. In Britain, you have think tanks close to the Tory party issuing a report after report saying that we should tie health benefits and insurance policy based to the uh, sort of uh, activity level of individuals. So these people who get insurance and health benefits from the state will only be able to claim that if through their smart card or their smartphone we would know that they have visited the gym. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, you can say that's very stupid, but once you arrive at a situation where the state simply has no money to continue paying for what they were paying before, simply because they're broke and, you know, there is no money left. Clear. Societies are aging. I'm this is where we are. So, like, I, I, all I'm saying is that you shouldn't expect a brochure being produced by your politician saying that that's what we want to do. I mean, that's happening much more indirectly and in a much more invisible manner by tinkering with policies that are much harder to track. Another question. There was one in the, in the, the middle here. Uh, yes, this person here in the middle. Can you reach? Can you reach this person? And maybe in the meantime, the other microphone can go to the other person so that we don't lose time already. Please raise your hand in the back. Who had the next question? Hello. Uh, yeah. My name is Bas van Zand. Bas van Zand. Uh, I'm a computer science student. Mm -hmm. um, my question, in the beginning you were talking about uh, that the politic is more and more moving to the individual instead yes. of uh, seeing the big scope of the problem. What can we do as individual of the society to... Yes. Uh, let the uh, politics change that vision. Yeah, you will. It's, a, it's, it's not an easy question. Uh, I think the, the problem is that uh, many young people are kind of, since they have not really had exposure to radical politics, having grown up in extremely neoliberal Europe of the 1990s and you know 2000, they just have no memory of how things could be run differently other than by you know a competitive market with a bunch of competitive companies providing every single service right <laughs> and it's very hard to even appeal to a different kind of political infrastructure political institution political sensibility anymore so uh i think if i were you i would be either looking like geographically outside of europe and you know south america would not be a bad place to look right now because i think at this point this is the place where at least you get some experiments with alternative modes of ownership and alternative modes of production or it will be looking outside of traditional political channels in europe and looking at some emerging <laughs> movements contesting uh what's happening at the european level what's happening at the level of the european central bank what's happening there i mean i i think that this is where most promising thinking is going to come from. Like, as much as I like this new emerging movements like the Pirate Party or, you know, like they are not, yeah, they are not moving in that direction as quickly and as aggressively as I would like them to do. I mean, they're so you're pointing not, you're important not, issues, yeah, but... You're yeah. not advocating traditional means of political change, setting up political, your own political party, trying to influence it, the current it, no, political No, 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 look, parties. I mean, it might, it, might, it might work. So, I mean, I, I have some hope for Greece and Spain, for example, where new political movements have been started recently, Podemos in Spain and Syriza in, in Greece. You know, and it might be that by getting into the European Parliament and getting into national parliaments, you might be able to get something done. But at this point, I mean, let's be honest, the only way in which either Syriza or Podemos can influence something at the European level is by getting in the European Parliament and blocking everything that they do there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, okay. It's kind of <laughs> next question. <laughs> next, uh, next question. The person who got his microphone. Please, will you pass back the microphone to? Yeah. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Vitek Tenhoff. Um, I'm from the the neighbor of the Radboud, the, the Han University. Ah, okay. I'm an instructor there. Um, uh, you described this. Um, well, you described as a problem uh, that. Um, smartphone that my smartphone tries to to uh, improve my my behavior um, mm -hmm. and you would like to see uh, another system uh, that uh, in which forces me to to show positive uh, so to, sh to show good behavior but isn't that just the the difference between uh, uh, the the moral uh, d described by Kant and the moral described by by, by util utilitarianism by by Bentham mm -hmm. it's a very old problem and um, there's a, there, there is no. This discussion goes on all the time. What, which is better? Is it uh, by by doing uh, doing good because I'm rewarded for it, or do it, is it by doing good 
by uh, being uh, by by for my own ethical ethical behavior. Mm -hmm. um, you, there's no, there's no. Th th this question has not been answered for century for for well not century but for for decades. Uh, mm -hmm. I Very think. good. I'd like to compliment you with the, uh, this question. I would have expected this from a philosophy student from here, and maybe not directly from <laughs> someone from the Han, but uh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but please, please answer. Um, I mean, look, I, I assume that you're talking specifically about gamification and not about everything else I've said about Google Now and self-tracking. So if you're talking specifically about the substitution <coughs> of kind of uh, moral and legal code of thinking with the techno market one. Uh, there, I think you can argue that the fundamental theoretical philosophical issue has always been the same. And that's, you know, the, the sort of the, the, the motivation, the, the, the kind of things that motivate you to, to, to behave, right? It's whether you're doing it because you value the good or the service in its own right, or whether you're doing it for some uh, ulterior uh, monetary or some other motive. Uh, so on the philosophical grounds, I think your diagnosis is, is, is adequate. The thing is that uh, the exact balance between those two motivations, I would argue, fluctuates historically and it changes historically. Right? And I would argue that the moment in which we live right now um, leaves less and less space for means of behavior that are not, and, and sort of motivations for behavior and also political subjectivities that are not purely based on market logic. And that in itself produces certain political subjects that then have a very hard time understanding how instead of pursuing individual solutions, they can actually come and work with others on pursuing change collectively, right? And so, I mean, there is, it's not just that, you know, by taking the monetary or the uh, kind of compensatory gamification route over the moral or legal one, you just uh, opt for the most efficient solution. You're also ending up as a very different type of political citizen and a political subject. And it, that subject in itself, who is very much responsive to the needs and the form of the market, that becomes the kind of political subject that cannot then engage in the kind of politics that might transform the system to begin with. So what I am arguing about is the uh, a rather specific historical distribution between those two modes and not the fact that you know, both of them can be traced to certain political philosophies. That in itself, of course, is true. But could it be that in the end we are just conditioned not to be against the system? So I also I always like these metaphors, and there, there are lots of... That's what conformists of say to themselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, to there, there are lots of these utopian novels, and they are nice metaphors, and usually you have this Big Brother one, and I like Walden by Skinner, behavioral yeah. engineering, so where the whole population is already conditioned to think they're uh, happy. Yeah. But the most worst example maybe where we're heading then, and that's my question, there's the book by uh, Forster, uh, 1928, I guess, the machine stops, where everybody is in his little cubicle and everything comes from the machine. And Google or something like that might become the machine that, that j just gives us everything, just like Google Now. Um, and then we will never revolt or something like that. Might that happen? Well, I mean, we already live under a machine, and that machine is called capitalism. I mean, so, I mean, Google is not an autonomous like, creature that exists out of market forces. It's a company that is traded at, you know, multi-billion value, that does all its business through advertising, that uh, operates the way it does because of failure of certain regulatory decisions in Brussels and Washington and elsewhere. And, you know, so for me to take Google now, n not the app, but the actual company, to take it today, and to present it as an embodiment of some kind of mechanistic engineering mindset, as opposed to a giant corporation with a very bizarre business model and a lot of uh, clout in Brussels and elsewhere, would be problematic. Because then you will end up blaming technology, and then you'll end up in this kind of, you know, quasi-Heideggerian argument about the limits of modernity and how it's all in framing all of us, and, and, and so forth and so forth. Well, in fact, I think the problem is very different. Like, there are very good productive things you can do with technology, sensors, real-time communication, and planning. Just written uh, an essay looking at the use of cybernetics and real-time planning in, in Chile under Salvador Allende in the early 70s, 
And there you can clearly see that a very similar kind of Internet of Things, real-time big data mentality can also be joined with a very different political project. So there is nothing about this infrastructure that we are erecting today that would uh, make it uh, you know, conducive just to mechanization of our thought and mechanization of our individualism. It can be put to a very different political agenda. The reason why it's not being put to a very different political agenda is because we're already living under one agenda, and that agenda is just too solid to, to, to crack. Can I ask you a, qu <coughs> a question here? So uh, one of your main points is that the, the shift from causes to, to effects. We're no, no longer thinking in terms of causes. This is a slightly provocative statement at a university where mm. I think people... Uh, uh, are being trained to to uh, uh, think fundamentally about the underlying sure. mechanisms. Sure. What's what's going on? What what is the impact of your story for institutions like universities? You you briefly mentioned them. Now mm -hmm. this is a a, a, a complicated uh, question. You can differentiate uh, the, the the influence on teaching, for instance, or or the influence on, on uh, the, the research, the way yeah. the research is being done. Or maybe maybe the most interesting one is on the idea, this maybe naive idea that universities educate a, a, a new critical generation. Yeah. Are you pessimistic about this? That what, that we're educating a new critical generation? Uh, that we're not doing this. Uh, well, on, in certain disciplines like economics, we're clearly not doing that. Even okay. though you do see certain moves to actually shake up the curriculum and introduce more radical okay. uh, thinking on, on, on the reading list. But um, I think what's happening in the universities is not very different from what's happening in other domains, and that students are encouraged to prepare for the job market. And this yeah. is how you know, the entire system now uh, privileges uh, marketable skills that can be learned and deployed quickly on the job which do not necessarily map that easily on the critical skills that we normally associate with the university. So we want adaptability, we want resourcefulness, we want resilience, and we end up essentially teaching people how to code because that's the arch objective. If you know how to code, you can adapt to anything. You can code your own way out of yeah. any problem. Do we, right? do we recognize this? Do people recognize this in the audience? <laughs> I see two fingers here, uh, down here. Two, three. This is kind of a moralist question to uh, Mr. Bart Jacobs as well. But well, aren't we, in a sense, uh, gamifying the uh, education system as well uh, when we are handing out points for just attending to classes or making your homework <laughs> uh, instead of uh, trying to really understand uh, the lecture? And, uh, yeah, shouldn't... Uh, a, a, an academic degree <laughs> be based on um, intrinsic motivation, etc. Yeah. And I've been and waiting for this for years. On, uh, <laughs> a bit less on uh, what, how you make your exam, and yeah. a bit more on uh, how you, the way you think, which yeah, that's is true. Sh what no, academic should be, in I, my I, opinion. If I may briefly answer this, ideally, I fully, I fully agree. Uh, uh, the, the, not all of your colleague students work uh, uh, like this, but at least. At least uh, in my courses, we're not using apps yet to to monitor how much home time you spend on homework and and uh, uh, how intensively you work on these kind of issues. But you so would once you yet. move to MOOCs and editors yeah, and I the systems not, which okay, yeah, no, 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 yeah. but sure. But like <laughs> that's the possibility that is actually advertised in a lot of universities in yeah. the U.S. now. That as you move to digital systems, it actually becomes possible to know whether the student has read the book or not because the book itself is digital. Right, uh, and, and that does create new mechanisms of control. Right, and uh, there is a debate that's happening in education about the use of grades. And you know, you can also argue that the grades are actually needed by prospective employers because they need a way to sort out good students from bad students. Uh, and so, grades will always be there. But uh, in America, for example, that is pushed even beyond grades, where there is a movement that wants to pay students for good grades. Right, it's a standard practice in many schools to actually reward students with cash. And, you know, many parents do that, thinking that it's a good idea. And, you know, and it's, I mean, it's a big debate as to and that sort of also framed as an intrusion of markets into, into everything. But the questions of causality, I think, they're, they're very, 
they're very important. And what, what puzzles me so much is that in many domains, it has actually become something like a badge of honor to say that you don't care about causality. I mean, I, I, I've written in that essay about Chile, I've written about a guy in New York who was there, a former chief data officer. It was a new job created in, uh, in, in New York City. And his job was to understand which buildings are most likely to catch fire in New York, right? Because he has fire inspectors to send out. And of course, in the past, when the state was, had money, when you know, in inspectors were many, you could deploy 100 inspectors to virtually every second building in New York and check how likely they to catch fire. I mean, now this guy is stuck with probably three or five inspectors. Like, what does he do? He can dispatch Build inspectors to random buildings. He can uh, ins uh, send inspectors to buildings in some alphabetical order. Or he can draw on past data about where fires have broken out in the past and build some kind of a model where he will have correlations. So he would know that buildings that where tenants have defaulted on their mortgage are more likely to catch fire and thus cause an, and send inspectors to those buildings. The guy himself says that I have no idea why this is happening. Like I don't need to investigate why buildings where tenants have defaulted on mortgages catch fire. All I need as an inspector is to know that they do, right? And you know, if that's the paradigm according to which we operate, you can clearly see that the storage, collection, and proliferation of data allows to adopt that kind of logic in virtually any domain. You can optimize based on data, but by optimizing based on data, you're also sidestepping questions about what has caused the problem. And it might be that there are factors that have caused the problem that can and should be tackled, but cannot be tackled through data alone. And that's what yeah. worries me. When, when you look at your, uh, your arguments from a psychological level, are you arguing in favor of intrinsic motivation? Mm -hmm. is, that, is that very... Is if, that you're talking about, if you're talking about gamification, then, uh, you know, again, it's hard for me to argue that anybody has intrinsic motivation to pick up litter from the pavement. Sure. I mean, it, it, it's and clearly a political will process help to, that to, goes... Yeah. What will help? Uh, a few nudges will help people to to uh, to uh, make certain behavior intrinsic. That's why uh, students in the ideal system also get a few marks, and then hopefully at some stage they get the intrinsic motivation to study themselves. Sure, sure, sure. But yeah, again, but it depends on sort of what's the broader rationale behind nudging. You might be nudged to pick up that letter with the view that you know you will get some monetary <laughs> compensation out of it. You might be notched with, you know, some kind of public ad saying that, well, good yeah. citizenship is good citizenship, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's a, there are different kinds of nudging. Sure. But then the discussion is about a different kind of nudging? Or is it, is it a different... But you weren't even talking about money. Well, I mean, yeah, we're talking about grades. No, 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 yeah, no. We're talking about everything. <laughs> 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 okay, this is, a, this is a bit chaotic. The lady, lady over there, yeah, down here, she had a question, I think. Or was I mistaken? The wrong hand? Oh, okay. The guy next to her. Sorry. Hi, my name is Jan van Moorgraft. I'm a second year cybersecurity student here. And I have both a statement and a question. And the I hope statement. It's a short statement? Yeah, it's a short statement. It's yeah. a short statement about um, what you said about the critical generation. Because yes. um, together with some fellow students, we started a project where the idea is to create certain services that actually offer privacy. And we talked to, uh, at least I talked to a lot of uh, students around here, and I'm talking about like um, about 50, for example, uh -huh. here around university. And they were all really enthusiastic when they heard about the level of privacy that we were trying to work for uh -huh. because they feel that that is something that the society is lacking and that the society should move towards to. So on that note, I don't really agree with your statement from personal experience. So well, which I don't statement? Really remember what statement, statement I made. Yeah, but, which uh, statement it's, it's precisely? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> about the fact that the universities are not creating the critical generation. Ah, okay. because great. No, like, well, if I'm like, like, I'm happy to be wrong on this issue. Because I'm okay. just, I'm just sharing my my <laughs> personal experience here. Yeah. Good. And what was your question? Well, my question is uh, because also from the same project, I have a lot of discussions with adults, and some adults actually uh, tell me that privacy these days, um, um, people. The, the adults don't have the same problems with privacy that the new generation will have because they say they understand privacy, but then they have their location filter on, their Wi-Fi on everywhere, which is a sign that they don't because they don't understand the collection of data. But how do you think that uh, well, a certain kind of ignorance or a lack of awareness of what this data can actually mean has an influence on how people treat it? Um. 
Well, I mean, it's an empirical question. I mean, there are people conducting surveys looking into, you know, what people think about privacy, what they actually know about privacy, and then tracing how they actually behave with that knowledge. So it's a question you've asked, you can sort of empirically answer it. Uh, my own view on this is that, you know, there are certain, again, political assumptions that are being made in us framing this as just questions of control, right? control of our information. And a lot of, at the very beginning, if you look at like 10 years ago, a lot of Silicon Valley companies, especially Facebook, felt very uneasy, even with this discussion about control. They wanted to make as many of your activities open as possible. You remember all those statements by Mark Zuckerberg where he said, you know, if you're not open and transparent, perhaps, you know, you're not honest or you must be hiding something. You're like, we need, you want to make the world a better place by making it more open and transparent. That was their idea, that they need to force you to share. They need to force you to be open and transparent, right? To abandon control over information. If you closely look at what has happened in the last 10 years, they have actually quietly embraced the idea that you can give users some control or more control over their data. You can allow them to share a certain fact with just five people or with just one person. You can allow them to share this picture with just three people who they went to school with and not with their workers. They're continuing like adding all of this seemingly um, nice features that allow you to become even more granular in what you share and what you not share. But what's lost in this is that Facebook's business model is not tied to how much data you share. It's tied to how much activity you generate on the site. Because ultimately, it's the clicks that advertisers want. So whether you share something with just one person or with the entire humanity, you know, it's not that relevant. Right? So there, you clearly see how important it is to reframe the very question we are asking from the paradigm of control. Like, do I have control over my settings, privacy settings? I can imagine that in five years, Facebook will give you absolute control over your privacy settings. Right? The problem is that the world in itself will transform itself in such a way that you'll actually have incentives, first of all, to disclose what you are and what you do, because you'll get some monetary benefits for it. And secondly, the information that you will be generating through clicks will end up, in one way or another, shaping what you do elsewhere in your life. So, you know, all that information that Facebook is now sucking in, it will be used to personalize what you buy, it will be used to personalize what you interact with, it will be used to personalize your filter, that filter is what you see in your newsfeed, which traditionally is not really a question of privacy, but it will have a profound effect on your formation as a subject, your formation as a citizen. Right? So, like, I'm not really answering your question, I'm just pointing out that, you know, the way in which you even define privacy, whether it's an issue of control, whether it's an issue of your, how su your subjectivity is being formed, whether it's a question of, you know, how much economic power you want to delegate to companies matters. And I would really urge, you know, all the young people here to be very careful in what specific definition of privacy you want to work with, because many of those definitions would actually be eagerly accepted by many of the companies who we traditionally think as enemies of privacy. Well, you clear question here in the middle. Um, Your name, please, and background. Is it on? Yes, yes. it's on. Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Barbara Strating, and I've studied uh, both philosophy and cultural studies at this university. Um, my question is somewhat co related to your former statement that um, Within all this discussion on data, we always talk about privacy and about how my individual privacy. But I think what's more in danger here is not so much the individual privacy, but the public realm as such. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's almost impossible to perform some kind of citizenship within a public realm when everything I do outside and inside of my house um, is uh, being controlled by either the government or... Um, yeah. Um, Private company. Yeah. So my, but my question is then: Is there also some possibility to escape this system within the system itself? As uh, I mean, in your book, the Net Illusion, you um, take also note of the political activist on Facebook who is still able to perform his acti activist mm -hmm. um, yet on Facebook and being um, monitored. So yes. I mean, is there also a possibility to escape it within? Um, I mean, technically, yes. I mean, there are all sorts of people now advocating strategies like obfuscation. I mean, you can create accounts on Google or Facebook and feed them with fake data. I mean, you can 
play searches for items you never need. You can have imaginary friends. I mean, there are all sorts of things in which you can sort of trick the algorithms. Then, of course, their services will become somewhat less useful. So, I mean, there are ways in which you can kind of get by without some of the constraints imposed by personalization. Uh, I think the, the bigger problem, and then, of course, there are tools you can purchase at a fee and have, you know, a phone that is fully encrypted. I mean, all, all of that is, is, is on the table. I think what we really want to do, though, is to, again, start thinking about alternative infrastructures we can set up in place so that people can start forming uh, new radical social movements to, to engage in the real serious political change. My fear is that, you know, our diagnosis of the current situation where we say that, well, but look, many of these movements like Occupy or whatever has come to, you know, replace it afterwards, they kind of eventually fizzle out. They do not coalesce into anything bigger. And while it's clear that they fizzle out also for reasons that have to do with their internal politics, for me it's also clear that the environment in which they operate, the technological environment in which they operate, is uh, so controllable, so surveyable, so transparent, and so easy to manipulate, and so easy to preempt. And I, I'm thinking about the next protest that might break out in a year or two at a public space that is entirely controlled and monitored uh, by drones, uh, that will have cameras that will know everything about the likelihood of certain people in that public area to get engaged in some kind of civic disobedience or public protest. I mean, that's, the, that's the, the future that's almost here. I mean, you already have police using drones all the time for their own you know, policing purposes. And if that's the case, then the desperation that we see in the contemporary political situation is only partly a failure of internal politics of these movements, and largely it's also a failure of the great power imbalance that exists between those movements and the authorities. And then all we can do is to try to figure out how we can take some of the money our own money that through taxes is being raised and then through Com European Commission and other institutions is being channeled to all sorts of national telecom monopolies. I mean, it doesn't, it's not channeled to build the centralized secure infrastructure. It's being channeled to very different purposes because the process itself is in one way or another controlled by lobbyists of those companies, right? And this is like, it's a very complicated situation and there is nothing, there is no app we can build but it's clearly there is a need to trace what the movements are doing, why they're doing what they're doing, how they can do it better, where can the money come from, what can we do on the political level. That's how political analysis happens. We cannot just, you know, focus on one particular dimension and channel of our energy there. We have to be strategic. Well, the police or the authorities don't need drones. I mean, they can simply put push malware onto our phones. Which well, allegedly just so in America, they're using to, tanks to, yeah, to yeah, quiet yeah, down yeah, a regular yeah. protest in Ferguson. So, I mean, yes. But. So, <laughs> okay. So whatever is left is... <laughs> Malware is what they do in liberal is. Holland. Like yeah, in yeah. America, they just roll out the tanks. <laughs> I have several questions. The lady here in, the, in front first. Uh, my and name then, is then over there, yeah. Maybe. My name is Louisa. I'm a student of uh, media design and communication in Rotterdam. Ah, interesting. Um, Very good. I just wanted to address this issue of uh, um, the positive message of um, what can we do to actually change things in a better way. And um, well, apparently, the, yeah, the, the more it's very unlikely that we're going to change anything if we don't change anything in our behavior. Um, in a sense that any evolution does this pain, so it it must must hurt if we want to go further somehow. We have to unplug, maybe. Is there, do you see any, any, any possibility that this ideology turns a bit and that we learn how to uh, be willing to control less in order to be less controlled? Because all this control upon ourselves is just a direct measure of how much we want to control. Mm. Should right. we smash Facebook and Google in whatever way? Not, not, sm uh, not or, or smash, but this, this unplug. smash. Unplug, you may... We want, we want to see everything all the time. We want to have the Google map on our hand. We want, we want to know everything and it's in the yeah. same measure. You see, it's, it's, a very, it's a very difficult question and I, I'm asked it often. You see, the problem is that part of me wants to say that, well, we citizens ought to know better. We should stop using Facebook. We should stop using Google. We should move to fully secure in the encrypted services that, well, just, you know, let's start using PGP keys and spending 
20 seconds more on our communication that we normally do and thus, you know, protect ourselves. Uh, the problem, however, with framing the argument that way is that it kind of loses sight of the, again, the specific situation in which people find themselves today. I mean, Google now does offer a genuine service, and that service does generate time out of thin air. You know, and if you are somebody who works three jobs, which probably is the future for many people who are young today, because forget about nine to five job that your parents had, if that's the future, then you know, something that draws on all of your data to generate an extra hour in your life, it's easy for me to understand why people opt for those uh, solutions. And to blame them for that would be to blame them for the failure of you know, politicians and of the failure of the political system to generate alternative infrastructures and alternative services that can deliver some of the same good with that data. Right? And the worst you want, the, like, the worst thing that can happen is that we would actually tie the hands of uh, radical social movements and radical thinkers who would, uh, on principle, refuse to use the tools of their enemies. And I would argue this is what has happened to somebody like Richard Stallman, who up to this day does not use a graphical browser, and as a result, Richard Stallman is invisible uh, in much of the kind of digital public debate today, while some of his enemies, like Tim O'Reilly, are there with one million Twitter followers directing the conversation on every single issue, right? And that's a choice. You can choose whether you want, for principle, to do it or not to do it. I think here, ultimately, you're talking about the question of kind of strategy and, and like, what do you want to do? And I don't want to put ethics above strategy, because it's very easy for us to internalize the failures of the current technological and political system and assume that they are our own fault. Well, in fact, they're not our own fault. And while it would be nice if we were using something else, that should not prevent us from taking advantage from everything that's at our disposal to, to, to fight, right? And so that's how I think about it. So, I mean, I don't know if it's positive enough, but I don't want people to get the wrong idea, like that, you know, they can fight the problems that all the problems are talking about through some kind of individual act of unplugging and disengagement or slightly better moving to more secure services. Like, you know, you can do it if you want, but it's, 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 it's a limited act. Very good. There's a gentleman over there who's waiting already for some time. My name is Jos Bajens. Uh, I'm a publisher. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, uh, My publisher, actually. Yes. <laughs> As it happens. <laughs> Naomi Klein just wrote you're, a book. You're, you're going to offer everyone a free copy of the book. Uh, well, I'm, I'm a market man, a businessman <laughs> as well. But <laughs> my, my question is, <clears throat> Naomi Klein wrote a book about climate change, and she states that climate change is uh, a capitalist problem. And unless we are going to solve capitalism, climate change is unsolvable. And yep. I hear you saying the same thing with privacy and, and, and datafication and, and solutionism. Yes. We are not going to solve this problem unless we are going to tackle neoliberalism. Yes. Mm. So wh what do you think? What are the similarities between you and Naomi Klein and what are the differences? Um, well, I mean, it's the same. Well, I mean, the, the structure of the argument is more or less the same. I mean, I, I've been trying to take debates that are presented to us as debates about technology or the digital or debates about pessimism or optimism. You know, there is this continuous debate and conversation about whether, you know, we like technology, we don't like technology, whether Twitter is good or bad. I mean, that conversation drives 90% of all debate on te te technology and digital issues, I'm afraid, and, and at least in the public realm. And I've been trying to take those conversations sort of out of this frame and resituate them in a different frame where we're talking about politics, economic interests, the kind of uh, ruling ideologies that you can see inside initiatives like nudging. You know, all of that, to me, you know, has seemed like a useful enterprise, but essentially the overall uh, objective there is the same. It's to present issues that are looked to us increasingly as just you know, failure of regulation. So, you know, we think that we just need to pass more and better laws and the problem will go away. Or we think that, well, we just need to kind of build some kind of European Google as if the main problem with Google is not the fact that it's collecting all the data, but the fact that it's American. I mean, that's not the main problem with Google. 
right? It's not enough to build a European Google because a European Google that will do everything that Google does, but will also have a European Commission flag outside of its office will be as bad, right? Uh, so, I mean, th there is a way in which I think our imagination uh, on what can be done is often so limited and it's limited precisely because the problem is not framed in its entirety, in its totality. And that's why I think, you know, Naomi Klein does a good job saying it's about climate change, where I think the argument is somewhat easier to make because you can clearly see how climate change is linked to economic activity. Uh, but you still see a lot of people who do not question the overall economic model that reduces climate change, making the case that, well, we just need to change our consumer behavior. We just need to buy more green products and climate change will go away. And I mean, so there, there is that crowd that I think is worth fighting. Um, in the case of technology, I think the crowd we need to be fighting, as, 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 as it pains me to say it, since there are so many legal, uh, probably professors and academics in this audience, it's the fact that you can solve all these problems through regulation. I just don't think that that's, that, 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 that's what we are looking at. It's not just a matter of regulation, and it's not just a matter of passing more laws. It's, it's a matter of perhaps creating new legal regimes for ownership, for running infrastructure, finding out some new ground between private and public ownership. This is where legal innovation might come from. But you know, the issues we need to tackle go far beyond just figuring out what the data protection directive should look like. That, to me, is obvious. Okay. Well, I completely agree with this, that, that for solving the whole thing, we, we should go um, beyond neoliberalism and you should uh, change the whole system. But I want to make the technological problem a bit worse again, um, because there are a, a number of artificial intelligence students. And mm -hmm. so we've talked about um, data and doing stuff with data manipulation, but algorithms are becoming um, more and more intelligent and it opens up possibilities for experimentation. Like what Facebook did with mm -hmm. uh, making people happy and some people not happy, they manipulated people's moods. Mm -hmm. And there's a very nice uh, thing called the robot scientist, uh, it's mm -hmm. uh, 15 years old, where a single machine is making all the decisions to perform automated experiments with yeast. Mm -hmm. So there's a machine that thinks about data, thinks about experiments, mm -hmm. does the experiments, mm -hmm. then uh, finds out what the results are, thinks about results, interprets them, finds new experiments, and so you have to fool scientific yeah. experimental loop that is possible in many contexts and especially facebook mm -hmm. so what is your view on that so if we um are getting increasingly more of these what i call skinner boxes where we are just being part of an experiment but mm -hmm. we don't know about it yes how does that change society what can we do with that and can we actually study um when <laughs> we are being experimented on or what happens or is it allowed? Is it ethical? Um, yes. That kind of stuff. So, breaking out the questions about economic ownership and you know, all of this sort of broader critique of neoliberalism that we've been talking about, I think breaking, bracketing the, all of that out, to me it's obvious that I would rather to have filters and algorithms and sensors that have gone through some kind of public accountability process and that have been vetted and that perhaps are regularly examined for how they perform. Right? So whether it's through some kind of algorithmic auditing system or whether it's through something else, for me, yes, it's, it's a useful way in which we can actually inspect and make sure that there is no excessive manipulation that's happening. The problem is that Facebook filters out news from your newsfeed all the time. It's not like a bug, it's a feature. They do it because otherwise you'll be overwhelmed. Right, so there you run very quickly into kind of ideological arguments and debates as to what should count as relevant, whether you know news about a shooting in the town next to yours is more relevant than the news of Ebola in Nigeria, right? And this is where debates about relevance and what should matter to you as a citizen here and now become really political and very hard to adjudicate. So I cannot expect an auditor to step in and make that decision. Chances are that knowing about something happening in your town is more profitable to Facebook because it is, it's much easier to sell your products around that. So that, it might that, be that their business model will bias them always towards showing you certain stories and producing certain you know, political subjects. But you know, to change that 
like to me it's obvious that that will be the case because this is a private company that wants to make money they will always be manipulating in that way so like you can maybe impose conditions and say well it can only be a town that's within the 20 kilometer radius from you know your town and not 25 kilometers i mean that's what you can regulate that but to me it's kind of yeah, very if we, unambitious if, if we rationalize this whole strategy i can i can see that sometimes you can really see okay this is relevant because it's close to me but th what if there's a really a bad intent behind it so um the algorithm just gets the, the the overall goal get more people to vote for the democrats no matter what just hey. manipulate everything no, that, that happens already yeah. yes, sure, how would sure. you i mean I don't know, regulate or uh, notice even that mm. that happens. I mean, mm. we have no means. No, I mean, look, I mean, they're like, don't doubt the capacity of lawyers to come up with legal doctrines. I mean, <laughs> no. like, they're already coming up with them. Concepts like, you know, fiduciary responsibility. I mean, there are people in America and both in Europe who are coming up with ways in which uh, they would want to have Facebook and Google uh, sort of comply with a set of things they're not going to do given how powerful they are as filtering mechanisms. It's not just uh, the voting. I mean, I remember when there was this huge outrage over the SOPA bill in America, where everybody was protesting against this new copyright law that people thought was going to be very bad for, for digital rights and freedoms. Google just put uh, a banner, an anti-SOPA banner, on their search box. So everybody saw it, right? And you can clearly see how easily Google can influence people to take certain actions with particular goals in mind. I mean, but that problem is solvable. You just tell these companies that, well, you know, you should not be in the position to manipulate your audience uh, with some kind of political agenda in mind. I mean, that you can do. I mean, that doesn't really bother me as much. What bothers me is that all of those small manipulations add up as well. And it's those smaller manipulations that we cannot actually control for because they fall within the sort of basic business logic of those companies. They manipulate you because otherwise they will be out of business. Yeah. I can allow one last question. Unfortunately, this gentleman is already waiting for some time. Uh, the honor goes to him. I hope it will be a very good question. Uh, <laughs> if not, we'll have to take another one. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> All the pressure is on you now. <laughs> yeah. Does it work? Oh, Hello, does it work? Yes. 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 Uh, my name is Pim Kantebeen. I work for the Dutch government. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> Ministry of Education, Culture and Science. Maybe uh, we should ask you a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I wonder if, if you would design any kind of checks and balances to counteract uh. this kind of uh, the, the problem that you describe. How would you design it? So I'm trying to get you to, uh, to some kind of solutionism towards your own the problem that you described, but perhaps. You see, can I just uh, like have a counter question? What do you think is the problem I've described? And, and then ah. I'll talk about <laughs> checks and balances. <laughs> <laughs> One of the problems you described is that it's like you describe a kind of brave new world in which convenience uh -huh. is traded against personal freedom. Yeah. And we know from these kind from these writers that in this kind yes. uh, of problem, people choose convenience. At least most people do. Yes. I do talk also to st uh, there's one person in the Netherlands who doesn't follow uh, higher education because he doesn't uh, he wants to use Linux, yes. and uh, he can he cannot access university with Linux according to his opinion. But that's a very lonely man. I offered a coffee uh, in return for his story, and he uh -huh. uh, he fixes bicycles today. So it's not a, a choice that uh, many people are willing to make. Sure. So probably the solution has to come from some uh, uh, from some other direction. And I wonder how could we organize it? How could we? Um, how could I, we I mean, look, I, I can try to articulate some light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, the the, the problem is that it's not going to come through checks and balances. I mean, it, it seems to me. So if by checks and balances we mean what are some kind of regulations and laws we can pass? I mean, yes, you can pass some kind of non-discriminatory laws to get this young man to go to university and study with Linux. I think there, it's sort of the standard question of rights and, you know, the, probably movements might emerge to ask for those rights to make sure that, you know, people who want to participate on different terms will participate on those terms. That's the story we have known, and that's what they sort of, the, the Rechstadt, the, the, law, the legal state can do very well, right? But the... 
outside of that, I think that the problems uh, at this point that start by asking what are the checks and balances, they presuppose that the government is the provider of the solution and not the cause of the problem. Uh, and I'm not saying that, um, you know, from a libertarian perspective. You could, uh, also, you could also uh, ask that activists or sure. uh, citizens maybe are able to use big data to control governments, to control companies like Google, just by collecting data and see what they are doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, in, in the theory, that sounds great. I mean, the problem is that try getting big data on Goldman Sachs and, and see how far you, you go. I mean, yes, ideally, we can think about the potential of open government. We can think about the potential of, you know, all these transparency movements. We can think about what can be done. But the reality is that you have some radical initiatives like Wikileaks that try to sidestep this problem through leaking, or you have in whistleblowing, or you have initiatives which try to be uh, kind of reformist and say, well, we need to go through Freedom of Information Act and laws and we need to do all of that. The problem is that right now, and that's what I've said, we are living in the times of profound epistemic asymmetry. That's, I, I may not have used that phrase, but that's like, I mean it. And it means that it's much easier for governments to gather information about you, the citizen, than for the citizen to gather information about either governments or corporations. So the power disbalance is already there. So, and then there is, of course, the power disbalance at the access to tools to analyze that data. I mean, the thing is that we can collect all the data we want as citizens, assuming that my kind of ideas for ownership of data at the communal level will work through. It is Google at this point which has the capacity to make sense of that data, right? It's not just that you can throw the data into you know, a smartphone and get great results. It's also a matter of AI. It's also a matter of server capacity. It's also a matter of very material, expensive things, which we, the public, have kind of completely either never developed or surrendered to the private sector. Right? So uh, again, I'm like, sorry, I cannot give you checks and balances, like in the list, the citizens can go and take and like start taking action. Because I don't want to give people the false impression that the problem here resides at the level of technology. Like, it doesn't. It resides at the level of ownership, infrastructure, finance, who puts money where, what rights we have over the world in which we live in, and to what extent you can even dream and imagine a non-market solution and a non-market logic uh, being present in those alternative social domains. And I'm afraid that that is not something we can easily address by putting big data in the hands of citizens, as much as I would like to say that. Like for me, there might be some benefits that will accrue from that shift, but they will probably be dwarfed in the overall damage that might happen as we distract citizens from far more radical causes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very sorry, but I'm afraid I have to stop here. Uh, I would like to thank Evgeny Morozov for his sharp, uh, uncomfortable analysis including uh, thorough criticism of neoliberalism. But I was also happy to hear, more or less ex uh, uh, explicitly here and there, a defense of soft values like social justice, dignity, and uh, um, uh, intrinsic motivation. And I think I can speak uh, uh, on behalf of all of us here in a university environment that these values are appreciated here. I would like to invite all of you for a warm round of applause for Evgeny. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Please.